Hey there, a happy advent of cyber number three. I'm Cybersecurity Meg, and I'm really stoked that you're here because we're going to have a lot of fun talking about phishing. Today, we're on task number 24. This is day 19 of Advent of Cyber 3, and I'm going to school you a little bit about phishing, some of the tactics and techniques that are used in phishing, and we're also going to walk through, of course, that's why you're here, the day number 19, uh, task 24 for phishing. So if you haven't already, the thing to do right off the bat, because it usually takes a few seconds, is to go and click Start Machine. It'll get your machine spun up, because we're going to be using that in just a few short minutes. If it doesn't already populate in a split view where you have the task on one side and the machine on the second, you can just click the Show Split View, and it'll do it for you. So let's get right into it. McSkitty received reports of multiple phishing attempts from various elves. Oh no, <laughs> one of the elves shared that the email was sent to her along with the attachment. The email was forwarded as a .email file along with the base64 encoded string and a text file as Grinch Enterprises up to their shenanigans. Let's go ahead and find out. So in the beginning of the task here, it talks a little bit about phishing. And what I really enjoy is it gives the actual definition of phishing accord in accordance with the MITRE attack framework. And that says adversaries may send phishing messages to gain access to victim systems. All forms of phishing are electronically delivered social engineering. Phishing can be targeted, known as spear phishing. In spear phishing, a specific individual, company, or industry will be targeted by the adversary. More generally, adversaries can conduct non-targeted phishing, such as in mass malware spam campaigns. Another really popular form of phishing is called whaling, and that is one the adversar adversary specifically targets a really important Im individual who likely has access to sensitive data or a lot of financial information within an industry. So whaling, because it's generally the big person that they're going after, and that's going to be the person who has a lot of access. So if that adversary is successful in garnering those in garnering those credentials, then they're probably going to get access to a lot of juicy stuff. So I'm going to go over looking at email headers. We're going to talk about why knowing how to look at email headers is important. We're going to talk about some of the basic signs to look for in phishing emails. And I'm going to talk to you about some of the most common uses of phishing in corporations today, how those are working. So it gives you a link right here that goes over the MITRE attack framework, some of the techniques used in phishing. I would highly recommend going through that and reading it just for your general knowledge. So what are we looking for in a phishing email? Uh, the task right here gives a bunch of really great examples of things that we can look for. So right off the bat, one of the questions is, do you know who is sending you the email? Is the email coming from someone that you would expect to be receiving an email from? Does the email address match the sender? So for example, Meg, I work at IBM. So if you got an email from meg at dell.com, that would probably be a little bit wonky. Whereas you know I work at IBM, so you would expect the domain and the email to be at ibm.com. Does the reply to email match the sender? Now, the reason this is really important to take note of. So there's two different email addresses in email headers that essentially have different functions. The from email is who the email is actually coming from, and the reply to email is who the email is going to go back to when you reply to it. And the reason this is always so important to know is because of a thing specifically ca called BEC phishing or BEC fraud, which is business email compromise. And what this is, is once a phishing campaign has been successful with an organization and those credentials have been compromised, an attacker pretends and emulates to be that specific person. And what they'll do is they'll send an email from the legitimate email account that was compromised. But when that person who receives the email responds, that respond email is generally going to go to the attacker's private email that they've set up, usually an ephemeral one um, set up that's going to be trash and doesn't have anything linked to it. You can't identify who it's actually being sent to, that kind of ordeal. But it's always really important to look at who the sender is and where the email is going to when you respond back. If there are two different email addresses, that could be a sign of phishing going on. In the email body, does the email greet you personally or is it really generic? That's something that's gonna be really important to look at too. If something says, 
hey Meg, as opposed to just hello there, that's usually a sign that an email is being sent out in mass and it could be an example of a phishing campaign. Whereas if it's addressing me by name, it knows me a little bit more personally and it's a bit more granular. Does the email contain any grammar mistakes such as misspelled words? So I'm a pretty good speller, but I definitely make some spelling and grammar mistakes. If there are a lot, you're gonna take this as a signal to look at the email a little bit more closely, especially if you're looking at emails in a professional capacity, whether it's when you're at work or if you're receiving an email from a company like Amazon to confirm your order. These are entities that generally aren't going to have a lot of spelling or grammar mistakes. They pride themselves in how they show themselves to their customers. But the adversaries who are trying to emulate these large organizations and are trying to fish you and get your credentials and whatnot, they don't really care about how you perceive them. They're going to be typing these attack messages out really quickly, which tends to lead to things being misspelled. Does the email give you a sense of urgency where you need to act fast, such as a deadline to prevent your account from being disabled? Social engineering, specifically phishing, preys on people's inability to think rationally and to think calmly. So if you receive an email saying, hey, your password's gonna expire in 24 hours, and if you don't change it by then, then all of your photos stored in your Google Cloud are gonna be deleted. That's not something that Google would do, but it's also preying on the fact that it's trying to get you to act on impulse and to not think rationally. They want you to make a split second decision where you're like, oh heck, if I don't do this within the next 24 hours, I'm gonna lose all of my Google photos. And then you just think on impulse and you're not thinking logically. And they get you to act quickly without really considering what you're doing, which ultimately kind of leads to you falling victim of phishing email. So anything that tries to get you to do something incredibly urgently, that's gonna be something to look out for as well. Does the email contain a link or a clickable button that redirects you to a website? Does the link match the sender or is it a random website? So why this is so important, when phishing emails are being sent, they're usually going to try to send you to a fake domain that is being used to try to harvest your credentials. Instead of it being google.com, it could be go0gle.com. And because you're not paying too much attention and you're just thinking quickly, you might not notice it. So what you always wanna do before you click on any kind of hyperlink or open an attachment, is to really consider the domain that you're going to. You can generally do that by hovering over the hyperlink and it'll tell you where it's going to lead you to. And instead of clicking on that hyperlink, what I would really recommend is going directly to the website itself that you know is safe and legitimate. Does the link match the sender or is it a random website? What that means is, does the link that you're going to match the domain of the sending domain in the email? So if I send you an email from meg at ibm.com and my hyperlink goes to, you know, 1bm.com, that's probably going to be something a little bit suspicious that you're going to want to pay attention to. Is there an attachment to the email? A lot of attachments contain malicious things that when you unfortunately open the attachment, it launches a specific set of malware. So it's always a really good idea to examine the attachment before you actually open it. And obviously to examine the email to discern if it's legitimate email or if it's a phishing one that's trying to maliciously impact you in some kind of negative way. So yay, now that we've gone through a bit of kind of the basic science to look for in phishing emails, we're gonna get started on actually getting through today's task. Ooh. <laughs> so I already went ahead and opened up my virtual machine. I have it launched. The first thing that you're going to do is go up here and click on this email icon for Thunderbird Mail. And automatically that should launch for you the specific phishing email that we're gonna be looking at today throughout our task. How exciting. We'll come back to this part later with some of the more commands that need to be executed because it's not relevant in the first few things that we'll be looking at. All right, so question number one, who was this email sent to? Now, what we're gonna do right off the bat is we're actually going to look at the email's headers. And if you're not familiar with what headers for an email are, you can go ahead and click on this link that TryHackMe provides, but I'll also explain to you. So headers 
include and contain all of the information about the email. Where did the email come from? Who sent it? Who, if you reply to the email, is it going to be going to? What hops did that email take in terms of servers to reach your server? Was SMTP, simple mail transfer protocol used? The email headers are going to give you all of that information accurately. Whereas unfortunately, it's pretty easy to spoof what you see in an email when you're just looking at the graphical user interface version of it. Oftentimes when fishers are trying to confuse you or trick you into opening an email, they're going to be able to spoof the from part of the email to make it look like an email is coming from megaibm.com, but really it could be coming from joe at iwanttohackyou.com and you wouldn't know unless you looked at the headers of it. So that's why we're going to be looking at the headers. I'll tell you this, you can look at the headers by going to more and view source. We're going to be doing all of the analysis of the headers manually today, which is pretty simple because all the questions asked are relatively straightforward and simple. But just in the back of your brain, if you're ever doing this in a corporate or enterprise environment, one of the tools that I really recommend that's free is called MX Toolbox. What you could do is just copy these headers and then paste it in the MX Toolbox. And it literally breaks it all down for you and tells you exactly what you need to know. So keep that in mind in case you're ever in a situation where you need to do some email header analysis. All right, so our first question is, who was the email sent to? At the very beginning of these email headers, we're seeing a lot of the server information, the signature, authentication results. I'll touch on this really briefly because it's not super relevant to this. I mean, it is relevant, but it's not asked about in this room. But if we're not familiar with it, SPF stands for Sender Policy Framework. And basically what that is, is if you, again, just Google it, you can read a bunch more on it, but I wanna to touch on it because it is really important. SPF, in short, is checking whether the IP address that the email comes from is noted in SPF records online to be able to be tied to that domain that the email is coming from. So every company has an SPF record. And what that is, is they say, my domain at IBM.com, you should only accept emails that come from the domain at IBM.com that come from these specific IP addresses. And it lists all those IP addresses out that you should be allowed to receive emails from at IBM.com from. And what happens is if you get an email that's not from one of those specific IP addresses and it's trying to use the IBM.com domain, then a lot of safe organizations who have appropriate safety checks in place for filtering emails, it's gonna reject that email from you because they know it's most likely phishing because IBM has already told us if you get an email that doesn't come from XYZ IP addresses, then it's not from us. And then that organization who's receiving the email can be like, ha ha, someone's trying to trick me. And they reject the email and the person who was supposed to receive it never gets it so they don't get fished. So that's what we're talking about here when we talk about SPF. It's basically a way for organizations to ensure that they're not being fished because it's checking the IP address that's tied to the domain and public records online. So we're gonna bypass all of this fun stuff right here. And we're gonna go down to the things that are a bit more relevant to us right now, which are, who was the email sent to? And we can see right here that the email was sent to Elf McPherson at tbfc.com. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is I'm gonna copy that, put it all up into the clipboard right here. And, uh-oh. I have fat fingered it, even though I don't have fat fingers, that's fine. <laughs> All right, first answer submitted. So that was super easy. It tells you right here who the email is being sent to. It says phishing emails use similar domains of their targets to increase the likelihood the recipient will be tricked into interacting with the email. Who does it say the email was from? The answer is the email address. So what it's saying when it's in this first part of the question, phishing emails use similar domains of their targets to increase the likelihood the recipient will be tricked in interacting with the email. That's kind of what I was talking about earlier, where if you get an email that comes from at go0gle.com, it's obviously not google.com, which is Google's actual domain. And so they're kind of tricking you by changing that second O into a zero. And if you're not thinking 
you just kind of quickly read the email, you're going to say, oh, this really does come from google.com, but it doesn't, and they're trying to fish you. So the point is that fishers typically use domains that look like the actual ones to get you to open the email and click on the hyperlinks. So our question is, who does it say the email is from? Again, easy peasy, customer service at t8fc.info. Yay, we got another one, right? Go us, go team. Sometimes phishing emails have a different reply to email address. If this email was replied to, what email address will receive the email response? Ooh, well, look right here, our headers tell us pretty plain and simply reply to, and it gives us the email address, fisher at tempmails.grinch. That's a great domain. So I think that was pretty straightforward and hopefully relatively easy for you to understand. Now, the next question says, less sophisticated phishing emails will have typos. What is the misspelled word in the email? So let's go ahead and read our email. You need to reset your password. Of course I do. A lot of phishing emails prey on the fact that you need to reset your password, so always be cautious of those. Dear Elf, we would like to inform you that your TBFC online banking has been temporarily limited because you haven't updated your password according to our new terms of use. You have to reset your password straight off until now to be able to use your online banking without limits. I think I found the word. This should be straight. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be our answer. Let's go ahead and type it in and give it a check. Yay, another right one. <laughs> The email contains a link that will redirect the recipient to a fraudulent website in an effort to collect credentials. What is the link to the credential harvesting website? So this is what I was saying earlier when I was talking about not just clicking on hyperlinks within suspicious emails willy nilly. What you can do instead is, uh, well, generally when you're using your own browser, you can hover over a hyperlink and it'll tell you exactly where it leads to. In this case, what we'll do is we'll go ahead and copy link location. And here we go right here. It's some um, weird dot grunch out phishing hyperlink, which is obviously quite a bit suspicious. So I hope that is the answer for our credential harvesting website. Boom, go us. View the email source code. There is an unusual email header. What is the header and its value? All right, we're gonna go back and we're going to look at the source code. Let me pull this down so you can see it more easily. All right, so all of the headers are going to be what are kind of left aligned here. Delivered to, that's legitimate. SMTP source, X received, ARC seal, ARC message, these are all legitimate. Authentication, return path received, received SPF, these are all legitimate. The message ID content type, MIME version two from reply X. Oh, I think we found it. Something tells me that X Grinch Fish is not an email header. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and choose that for my answer. All the other ones are legitimate and very common uh, factors to see in an email header. Boom, look at us go, we're on a roll. You received other reports of phishing attempts from other colleagues. Some of the other emails contained attachments. Open attachment.txt, what is the name of the attachment? All right, I can do that. Let me go ahead and minimize this. So you have right here email artifacts folder, which is going to be relevant throughout this box. It's asking us to open attachment.txt. Okay, no problem, I can do that. Let me go ahead and pull that down. And it wants to know what is the name of the attachment. So I can see pretty clearly and prettily, pretty prettily, that's definitely a great new word, go Meg. Pretty easily, I can see right here that the name of the attachment, because it quite literally says name, is password reset instructions dot PDF. Cool. All right, so again, this is just the headers of the specific file. It's telling you the content type, it's a PDF, the content disposition, the name of it, the attachment ID, and the content ID. 
So I think that's the last we're going to use for this attachment.txt. I'll go ahead and close that out. And then it wants to know what is the flag in the PDF file? And you're probably looking at all this and you're like, Meg, there's no PDF file in the email artifacts. That's okay. Calm down. We will get through it together. My mouse is backwards. I should have set that up appropriately, but when I go up, it, it just it doesn't do what it's supposed to do. So forgive me for my screen going kind of wonky. All right, what we're going to do, it says right here, below are the commands to assist you with analyzing the encoded attachment text file. Because when we have attachment open, you're looking at it and you're like, this makes no sense, Meg. I don't know what all this jumble means. What am I supposed to do with that? Well, let me tell you. So we're going to go up here and you're going to open your terminal. I'm going to go ahead and make it max size so that you all can see it a little bit more easily. And the first thing it's first thing we're going to do is we want to make sure to get into the right directory before we do anything. And um, so let's go ahead and do that. We're going to do CD for change directory. We're going to be using our little apostrophe brothers. And let me pull this down so I can actually see the directory we want to go to. So we're going to home, desktop, email, artifacts. Perfect. And the reason you want to put this in apostrophes is because if you don't, it's going to interpret this or read it as if it has two arguments and it's not going to execute it properly. So make sure to put it in apostrophes. If you don't, you're not going to get any good results. So now that we're in the appropriate directory, we're going to go and follow the instructions. How easy peasy. Why, thank you, Trihack. Maybe appreciate that. What we're going to do is we're going to use CAT to... CAT stands for concatenate or catenate, basically. And what it's going to do is it's just going to show us the output of that attachment.txt file. Let me go ahead and make this big again, since we know what we're doing now. So now that we have all this gobbledygook, which is base64 encoding, what we want to do is we want to actually decode all of this. So when we run this next uh, command, you're going to see us using the hyphen D switch, and that stands for decode. If you wanted to encode something, you would just use hyphen E, the switch for encoding. So let's go ahead and do that now. And you see a whole bunch of this other information that you're still probably looking at it like, what the heck does this mean, Meg? But no worries, because we have this nifty command right here that's going to actually change the output into a PDF file that we can look at. So that'll be really helpful. What we've just done is we've decoded the base64, and now we're going to be sending that output into a file that we'll be able to open and actually look at. So our last command that we're going to be running is cat attachment base64 only.txt. We're going to pipe it to base64 decoded and translate that output into a file that we can actually open. How exciting. Boom. Okay, so if it's successful, you'll just have this basically showing right here. I'm going to go ahead and move this down. And wow, look how magical. <laughs> it's a Christmas miracle. We have a file.pdf. I'm going to go ahead and open that. And we'll go down here and look at what our last question is. What is the flag in the PDF file? Uh, I guess it didn't open. Open. It's going. Boom. Now we have two. Two is always better than one. Great. So I'll go ahead and zoom in so everyone can see this really easily. But we have our final flag right here.
Yay, it looks like we've completed the task for the day. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you found this walkthrough to be informative. You learned something a little bit about BEC or business email compromise fraud. We talked about sender policy framework. We learned how to identify phishing emails. And most importantly, we got all the correct answers and walkthroughs for the Try Hack Me day number 19, task number 24. I hope you have a fantastic, fantastic holiday. Everything goes swell and we'll see you next time. Have a great day, guys. Bye.